Welcome to another Sales Wisdom podcast. We have Lani Heis with us. He's founder at enablement.ch. He's also a partner slash top five creator at Clay. So we're going to have fun discussing AI outreach today and Clay, one of my favorite tool. This podcast is brought to you by podpar.com. That is my company. If you want to launch or scale or monetize a podcast, you can go to podpar.com. It's also brought to you by her friends at Neurohacker here that created this uh, amazing supplement called Qualia, which I take to optimize my memory, my energy, my focus as an entrepreneur. So you can go to Neurohacker and I pick the caffeinated version of Qualia. Lani, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, thanks for the, for the intro. Uh, what I'm up to uh, these days, I mean, we, we're quite busy uh, helping clients putting their entire pipeline creation process on autopilot. We do that uh, mostly with other B2B tech companies and um, that don't want to follow the, let's say, traditional we hire 10 SDRs and they're going to call, call a bunch of people and uh, we're going to use Apollo and scrape the entire database, just blast everyone. Um, so we help them basically fire half the team or even more and uh, put that on autopilot and have like one, two really, really smart guys in the company uh, that manage the whole thing. Very interesting. Your background, you started at UBS. How does one go from trader yeah. to sales outreacher? <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a very good question. Like, there's even on my LinkedIn, there's like one bit missing that's like completely not even not relevant. Uh, I was I was uh, had quite a tour. Um, so I started at uh, UBS in in the investment uh, making side of things as a Swiss person, right? Like that's what we Swiss people do. We do chocolate and money, um, and uh, I went for the money, uh, and then and then I was like quite fed up with with. Uh, the whole banking and corporate and like basically I, that was the moment I knew like okay I will end up in like in startup kind of world. Uh, I did a quick uh, stint in nightlife and event management where I had my own party label for two years, uh, which is the best job a twenty three year old can have. But you grow out of it at some point, um, and then it was like time to get a real job. Uh, so and then I um, joined a marketing slash HubSpot agency. So I learned everything about like automation, process, ref ops, like all these type of things there. Uh, built the sales function uh, there. was like the first like founding A, if you want to call it that. And uh, built the entire sales team and learned everything about like outbound and processes and like all that uh, through lots and lots and lots of trial there. I heard you say um, you replace like half the team. Do you use that as a door opener? Like me, I'm A-B testing that. I get mostly um, positive responses, but you could understand why some people would be pissed by that. Uh, yes, but well, first of all, if they're pissed by that, then it's a culture mismatch, right? Uh, I Because I, we believe, um, I mean, we, we are in the comfortable position that we can disqualify 43%. I just looked it up the number last week. Um, 43% of the requests we got, we just basically qualify them, uh, disqualify them off the first meeting, um, just because there's not a match either because we can't help them or it's basically not a culture fit or whatever. Um, but it's actually a play that we run is we show them the cost of inaction uh, when we when we do outreach to someone and like, hey, you have like five BDRs. Uh, or so we, and then we have basically indexed the average salary of a BDR and like the whole total cost of ownership essentially of that team. And we can calculate, uh, put that against the number, what it would cost if just like one really well-trained person would operate the engine and then say, okay, look, this is what the, the whole play will cost you. This is what you're paying now. This is what you should be paying. Uh, if you work with us, we help you get there. Um, and here are clients, we actually pulled this off. Uh, so that's like one play we actually do. Right. And, and work pretty well. Yeah, your ICP, because I see crypto on your website. I see uh, some vest wearing VCs, Patagonia wearing VCs. So, like, who are you targeting as your ICP? I mean, so, yeah, so ideal ideal customer profile uh, is B2B fintech or B2B tech companies. It just happens because of my background work that lots of them are in the fintech space. That includes crypto. Um, it's not necessarily like a you don't, you don't have to be a crypto company. Um, what is actually needed is that you sell to other B2B companies um, that you have sort of like an ACV of 
20 to like 100 ish k where an outbound motion the way we help you build actually makes sense because it doesn't make sense if you're trying to break into google and win the 100 million or like the million dollar 10 million dollar deals like that's sales works different like used to do that uh, that works a bit different than kind of i don't know like if it's like 5k your acv then outbound the way we do it doesn't make sense then you're better off with a plg uh, style motion so that's actually what's important to us is that you um have the right acv of your target audience and you make already some revenue like 500k arr so you don't have to test if you even have product market fit so that's kind of like a couple of the, the things we're looking for do you really believe in PLG? I mean, for certain products, it works amazingly, right? Uh, in the B2B, in the B2C space, 100%. In in the B2, uh, B2B space as well, I think, like, well, you mentioned in, in, in the introduction, uh, Clay, that is mostly a PLG-driven motion. I mean, they heavily rely also on, like, users and their partner network, um, which I'm part of. So obviously there is surrounding assets that um, help with that PLG motion, but the product itself does a lot of the selling, right? Basically you can share templates, which helps with user generated content, et cetera. So they played it, for example, pretty nicely. Even I would argue HubSpot to some extent, which is like a big CRM, right? Like it's to some extent, even it's still a PLG motion. So I think there's a lot of good examples, but it's certainly a risky move um, if you don't know what you're actually doing. Interesting. And yourself, your clients, do you acquire them through Clay mostly? Um, so we, we actually looked at this uh, the other day. So the breakdown is 21% of our revenue is actually coming directly through our socials. So that's people seeing our LinkedIn content um, and saying, like, hey, it's amazing what you share. Can you show me how to do this? It's kind of like, so that's 21%. Um, around 30 to 35% is actually our own album. Um and the rest is referrals and like partners and like these type of things. Um, yeah, but mostly it's kind of like these are the three big ones. Any tips for the social content? Um, yes. So what, well, what's, what's the bottleneck for, for most people when they do social media content? The bottleneck mostly is, well, they don't know what to write and they don't know how to write it well uh, or what to say, etc. Um, once you actually would interview them, like basically what we're doing here right now, you can, uh, you get something out of them. So mostly it's just someone actually guiding that conversation. And then, so that's part one that uh, is, is missing. It's like, what do I write? And the second one is like, how do I actually write, say something? And this is where AI can be really, really helpful if you know how to do it correctly. Say it's just, it's quite similar to cold email. Like you can't just go to ChatGPT and be like, hey, write a LinkedIn post about uh, I don't know sales, right? Like it's just going to give you like a random vanilla post that doesn't work. Same with like a cold email. Hey, write a cold email to Charles and uh, pitch him my solution. It's not going to work pretty well because it lacks context, and that's the most important thing for for AI. Now what we do um, is is uh, with with basically how do we apply that? Uh, we I interviewed myself, uh, basically, I came up with like some couple of questions about topics. I get asked a lot. I then interviewed myself and used that transcript for that and basically cleaned it up a bit. I can upload that into uh, Claude, that uh, very, um, I call that context file because it gives basically a context. And like, hey, um, talk about basically create a couple of post ideas about these topics uh, using the input that just gave you. I like the context about myself. And that basically then creates broad outlines of posts um, with a lot of context. Basically that, for example, has like the story, how I learned how to use uh, GPT's AI. And uh, it was like once, like I stayed up to like 4 a.m. and like just work myself through like YouTubes and trying there. So that's like one story. So basically we'll use that and, 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 and include that in the post idea. What I then can do is upload that post idea, that rough outline, and uh, put that, I have a clay table for this, that has like 70 templates. Um, so I then just like, hey, is this post like a listicle? Is this a story? Is this like a how-to? Is this a case study? Or like, what's the broad category? Um, and here's the context. And then it creates me like five, six iterations on that post. And I just pick the one that I like the best, and I polish it. 
So it's it sounds probably more complicated than it actually is what I just told you, but essentially it's a two-step process. You have Claude, because it's better than ChatGPT at writing like a human. It's part one that gives you the broad outline. And the second part is, well, you have a bunch of templates, can be in an actual spreadsheet, uh, or in my case, I use Clay for it, uh, to then create actually the 90% perfect post. And then the last bit is just you need to polish it. And that just helps me within an hour, I can get, get like four good quality posts out a week. Interesting. I see gifts as well. I see that you uh, give out gifts uh, as well. So if people comment some uh, yes, keywords, yes. they will receive like clay tables. So uh, any comments on the format and the offer? Uh, so yeah, that's that's actually also something interesting. Um, I've by accident posted twice the same thing. And one time I had like the offer in it and one time I did it. One post got like 83,000 impressions and the other one got like 6,000. So the other one was like not bad, but it's also didn't really blow up. So it still was a real well-written post, but the other one just blew it out of the water. And that has to do with kind of like the engagement hacking or the algo hacking, just basically you create engagement, LinkedIn thinks it's valuable and, and pushes it up. So um, yeah, if you can give something away for free, that obviously makes sense. Uh, don't do it all the time, like once a week. I think that's kind of like a sweet spot. And the interesting, what it does to me is, well, it shows me, other than just giving a lot of impressions. Basically, it leaves me with a lot of people that commented. I programmatically, just every week, um, I built a scraper that just every week just scrapes, hey, here's all my posts. Here's all the people that, that scrapes everyone that commented. And that feeds it into a clay table. That clay table then just basically does some enrichments, tells me which one is my ICP, and they get enrolled into a very special campaign that's like highly targeted. And the, that campaign is like books meeting just left and right. So all I actually have to do for my outbound is predominantly just produce content because that creates engagement. Their engagement creates leads. So I don't really have to like scrape Apollo and like these type of things that much anymore. And that's Very why the, like, yeah, we call that whole thing because it's not typical outbound, but it's also not typical inbound. So we just call it all bound because it just picks the best out of both worlds. Interesting. Yeah, like so many tips there then uh do you have play sequences to engage folks that actually interacted with your linkedin posts yeah exactly so that's that, that's what i meant what what's, what's what i meant i scrape everyone that interacted i Got score it. them within within clay and then i just enroll them into the um into a campaign that we know it's just it's been performing absurdly well for that use case Pretty cool. What um, else is performing well in terms of new campaigns that you're launching from scratch? And if you want to share your screen, feel free to do so. Um, I will answer that on a conceptual level because it, it will slightly rephrase the question. What is something that a lot of people are doing wrong when they launch campaigns and what? how are they thinking it wrong? So I will rephrase the question because um, it's something I see a lot. And like I think by now everybody picked up on hey, you can use Clay and you can be really personal about things. And some even picked up, hey, you can use triggers. So, and it's been what, like since half a year, like it's everyone's talking about. And like now I see a lot of people picking it up. So, what that basically, if everyone's doing it, then it's kind of like uh, decreased the effectiveness. And I think what a lot of people forget is the underlying. What, what, what's at the core, because all that personalization and being relevant is all nice and it's important. However, if you don't have something valuable to say, i.e. your product is not what people need, there's no need for the product. You don't understand the ultimate pain because you don't talk to your customers very frequently. That means like multiple times a week. Or you have not found a value proposition like how to frame your offer in a way that like makes immediate sense to people then all the hyper-targeting, hyper-personalization is not going to do you any good. Because um, it's just, I always call it like putting lipstick on a pig, because that's essentially what you do, right? Like, it's like you make it really, really look really nice, but the underlying magic is not there. Um, and if you are really like early and like you're just testing things out, I have people where I type like, look, don't even get clay at the moment. We go there, but let's just test these five problem statements with these five um, value propositions. And then we actually going to uh, put all the magic and bells and whistles around it. But if the underlying messaging is not spot on, don't need that all that bells and whistles. 
Right. Yeah. A lot of people get these things wrong, but um, if you could show also an example of a clay campaign, uh, for example, you know, they're putting sure. the clay gent on their website and seeing what kind of events their company is preparing or what kind of events their company is likely to attend sure. or uh, distinguishing their ICP and so forth, going and seeing if they have a podcast. Like what are the, the most niche campaigns you've deployed lately on clay that have got amazing success um let me think of one i'm gonna show internal ones not the ones for clients um because i know i can basically decide on my own what what i want to share so one thing i'm gonna do is i'm gonna show you two things so i'm gonna show you the um i see you're probably gonna hate me for doing this but um Let's pick this one. Uh, so, okay, so first one, this is because uh, so everyone can see it. This is the clay table I was referring to with the templates. I just put the post idea here. I tell, hey, this is a listicle story or whatever. And depending on that, it will um, give me different post ideas. So that's what the one I was referring to. The other one um, is the how I pull in people that commented uh, on my post. So I just pull them into a clay table. Um, and this is also like for sophisticated clay users. If you want to say from clay credits, you can actually use Clayagent to scrape LinkedIn. Um, so you basically A, get up-to-date data. Sophisticated clay users know that the data provider clay users for LinkedIn is not always up-to-date. So um, I always try to scrape it directly, and it's also super cheap. Um, so you basically go on LinkedIn and, and, and source it from there, and you can always use it as a backup. Um, and you can do the same with the company. Um, and then we just do an ICP fit. Um, basically, we describe our ICP, and then it's like, hey, tell me, yes, no, maybe, if they're an ICP fit, same with the persona. And then we go and um, find your emails and like these type of things, and then we add them. Uh, to to the campaign. So um, so these are the tables I was just talking um, about. And then let me show you like another demo table I can. Yeah, the final email as well. Also, do you use Claude nowadays to write uh, emails in Clay? Um, so mm, not necessarily. I mean, to, so. On that note, on AI and which one to use, et cetera, I, because what we write is very, very straight to the point kind of thing. So, I, um, it's, so it's not, we actually don't need AI to be like super, super sophisticated about it. Um, so, we don't actually need like it doesn't really make like as i tested it like claude versus a uh, GPT, it doesn't produce better results or worse results because we're like very clear what we actually need um so yeah it doesn't really matter um so that one comes down to to a cost thing and the convenience thing and basically i've just been using uh open ai uh, more than than i've been using claude so i yeah, but I have both. I have pro license for both. I have API keys for both. But ultimately, right now, I'm using that. And especially since I think yesterday or yeah, yesterday, um, Omni came out, GPT for Omni. Um, yeah, it's faster and 50% cheaper. So right now, it's certainly more attractive, just cost wise, uh, what you can do. But um, another play, we call that clay puzzles because we do that with our clients. We look at the message that we say, like, hey, this is a perfect message. Um, oh, we look at an email that's really well written, let's put it this way. And then we reverse engineer, hey, how was the clay table set up in order to write that email? And there was like a post that went sort of viral on LinkedIn. And everyone was like, hey, I really loved that email. Um, well, the discussion essentially in the comment was like, is it, is it AI or is it uh, manually written? And the email basically went something like, hey, I saw in, in your job description, you mentioned cold calling a lot, I assume. You put a lot of emphasis on booking calls. Um, usually, this and that is the problem. Here's how you could solve it. Pretty standard uh, structure, nothing too crazy. But then I basically, with, together with, my, with our clients, when we consulted them, like, hey, here's how you would build it. Um, so, and, and that's 
the table I'm showing right now is essentially uh, that that table. How would you um, uh, do that? So essentially, you need a job description. You feed the job description. You then tell the AI, hey, look for um, something uh, in, in the job description, whatever it is, call calling or whatever. Um, and and then make some couple of inferences such as like, hey, which job title are they targeting? So you could um, use that as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's one that because uh, I also just commented a video, uh, posted a video on on that uh, last week or so uh, on that. So that's also like been a fun clay clay table to do. Um, I mean, there's there's so much uh, we could we could go through. Right. Um, I want to ask that. you a question though. Like, what's your brainstorming process once you either are like hey we need more clients uh for a company and then we need to launch something that's innovative that's different from what's out there what's this process like and then uh, how's that process for your clients so like mm -hmm. what's the, the brainstorming the creative process at play to yep. create an angle that hasn't been seen before yeah yeah so but, but going back to what I was um, mentioning in the beginning, like you need to get this like problem understanding pretty uh, right first, and then second, uh, your, your your value proposition. So usually just start there. Um, given now most people use something like Fireflies or Fathom or like any type of call recording, so we just tell, hey, give us 10, 20, 30 of those, and we analyze that to create actually a buyer persona. Um, so that's like pro tip, record all your sales calls, feed them into ChatGPT um, and, and all these like the transcripts and or even with Omni now you could just upload the MP4s um, and, and that will create a much better buyer persona um, and, and you will get, you will get a really good understanding. So that's basically one to really nail the buyer persona. Um, and then the next step we do is we get basically the customer like, hey, look, what are the, all the use cases? That you actually can have, like how can you provide value on the um so list that everything down so okay you could use my product to do this that etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then we put together with them what's what's called the sales story so basically hey this is the use case so it's like as a um sales leader i want to book more meetings and currently i'm using this process but that has the, uh, sort of like limitation x um, with our secret sauce, you can achieve X outcome without hurdle Y. So that's kind of like a, a, a framework that we put together. And then we just do that for all the ways they actually can think of um, the product might be useful. And that gives us essentially so many different angles because uh, each of these use case or sales story creates different angles in terms of like how you phrase the problem and also how you solve it. So, and then you just iterate through all of them. And then it's basically a bit of a question, like how big is your TAM, right? Like how many, like, do you have like a couple of thousands you can test this? So you then this limits the amount of variations you can test. So you need to be a bit more aware. If you have 100,000 people you can reach out to, okay, well, let's test a lot of those. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of like the core. And then all the other things, okay, well, how can we then um, use AI to make certain inferences if they have that pain, right? Like in Clay and, and, and Trigify and like all these tools to get us the data um, to just essentially make our targeting better uh, around that. Uh, but that's usually like on a broad level, that's kind of like the, the our thought process. There is great insights here. So thanks for that. Uh, what are your top goals this year uh, to grow the agency? Um, so we, we, well, first of all, we, one big goal, uh, for us is so because we have two sides of the business, we have the consulting side of the business, um, and, and the agency side of the business, uh, goal is heavily focusing on the consulting, um, cause we just see a lot of demand that people say, Hey, look, love an agency, but I don't actually want to depend on them. So I want to basically insource that. Um, so, um, really working on the consulting product, uh, which is also the core um, uh, of, 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 of our current offering um, and make that really, really, I think already we have by far the best in the market because I know what's in the market. So, but going ahead there. The second part uh, of that is to um, integrate it with our own micro SaaS stack. We have basically one is a smart lead to HubSpot integration. Um, and add, the, uh, add uh, so that basically takes care of like email to HubSpot sync. So the goal there is to also in, um, get other tools integrated, such as like HeyReach. So you basically can do really omni-channel 
um, on that end and, and integrate that as well. So that's like another, like so there's like certain tool aspects uh, we want to improve. Um, but these are like the big pushes for the next, let's say, two quarters, like the OKRs for this quarter and for the next one are both around customer experience on the consulting side of things, because um, that will also then improve like MR and retention, like all these type of things. Um, and the second one is the product, uh, the, the Microsoft and, and launch the, the, the second product, uh, which has to do with like LinkedIn scraping, which we currently have a POC. But do you think of Play as a startup? Do you think uh, they might reach the unicorn mark this year, the next? And uh, what have you learned from yeah, them deploying uh, that many features and the way they've been building? Very good question. So, I mean, with regards to unicorn status, that is obviously, well, how do you do an evaluation? As far as I know, uh, Kareem, he had a friends and family round like way back when, um, but they haven't really raised funding ever since, from what I know, uh, at least on Crunchbase. I couldn't, because I looked it up once because I was curious. Um, so obviously, you know, the evaluation thing like, would require them to actually raise a round to, so we can do the, the evaluation. So I can't really comment on that because um, uh, it would just be guessing, right? Um, how to, to evaluate that because I don't, also don't know basically any any revenue numbers in detail that I could apply a normal, let's say, 7 to 10x multiple on, 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 on that. Um, but did they achieve something that will make them a unicorn, whether or not on paper, i.e. by evaluation, or just what we conceptually think of unicorn, which is with like a category leader that they put their name out there and create a category? Certainly, like that's that's what they achieved. And, um, and which is, I think, the more, more important one, because it's also a very defendable mode. Like, yes, there comes like copycat that literally copy paste every feature. But play, what did they do really well? I think that was like part, second part of the question. Like, what did I learn from that? I think Clay has an amazing community um, with really, really smart people and like some of the smartest people uh, in the space that I've met and, and talked to. They have an amazing team internally. Like I know lots of people um, uh, that I talk to in the support chats and the Slack channels and like one-on-one, -on -one, like they're amazing people and really, really close to the customer. Um, and just the speed of iterations and how fast they actually push in the product without it being half-baked. You can push a lot of shit pretty quickly, but there's rarely that like a half-baked update comes out that kind of like breaks. And if it does, they're super open to listen to feedback once they had like a slight change in like how they validated emails and they deactivated a certain function because certain providers said like, hey, we don't um, need catch all validation anymore. And it's like, I pointed out like, hey, I ran a test. This is bullshit. Like within an hour, it was updated. Um, so they're like super, super fast. And I think whether or not you're a tech company, a consulting business or anything else, like the, the speed of iterations and how fast they actually are able to incorporate customer feedback is absolutely insane. And then there's obviously the whole go-to market motion of theirs with like the, the user generated content, their partner network. Um, that's also like textbook, especially because it's a product that actually needs to be explained because um, it's a new category. So I think it's, yeah, it will be a case study to look out for in a couple of years on how to create a category successfully, 100%. Lanny, thanks for the value today. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, easiest is follow on LinkedIn. I like, a, as I said, I have my own content generation framework. Uh, so just follow follow there. Uh, Lanny Heights, uh, I'm not hard to find. Uh, follow along, message me, DM me. And uh, obviously, if you have five to 10 BDRs and you want to get rid of them uh, and, and be more efficient, reach out to me, happy to chat.